con men, the most devious of all criminals. Charming, cool and calculating, they betray trust and devastate lives, yet remain a complete enigma. We are about to explore the mysterious world of these master criminals, giving an unprecedented insight into the workings of the complex minds of some of the world's most cunning con men and women. We will reveal the detail and the intricacies of their elaborate crimes and uncover how they were dramatically brought to justice. In this show, a globetrotting Colombian whose crimes, it's estimated, have made him more than a million pounds in the last decade and seen him named as one of the most gifted confidence tricksters in the world. Juan Betancourt is quite possibly the quintessential con man. And to fully explore and understand the quintessential con man's suave strategy, experts such as forensic psychologist Kerry Danes will offer their own unique analysis. So he strolls into the world's finest and grandest hotels, completely empty-handed, and then he strolls out with money, credit cards, jewellery and passports. He's a con man, escape artist, possesses a dozen aliases and with the type of charm that can only be described as hypnotic. A criminal so ice cool that even when sent to prison, he was able to con his way out of the front door. He was just two months into a three and a half year sentence and he walked out the door for a dentist appointment and just kept on walking. In the most exclusive five-star hotels around the world, glamorous guests experience the finest hospitality on offer. But in this elite environment, a con man developed a near-perfect five-star scam. For over a decade, Juan Carlos Guzman Betancourt preyed upon these exclusive locations. His aim was to rob their wealthiest clients. The handsome, charming and suave con man's career and his perfectly honed hotel hustle has been closely followed by court correspondent Sarah O'Connor. He always presents himself as a guest. He might have a coffee, he might change some money, um, and make sure that staff recognise him, he becomes a familiar face around the hotel. Well, all hotels are quite small communities. Once the staff have seen you in a cafe or at the reception desk a couple of times, they tend to accept you as somebody who's actually staying there. Most con men actually want to go by unnoticed. But in this case, Betancourt actually made the most of making friendships, if you like, with hotel staff. He was at least familiar to them. He was around, he made himself noticeable so that they would think that he was a hotel guest. And essentially, in being noticeable, he became almost anonymous. One man who knows how Betancourt operates better than most is the Irish police officer, or Garda officer, who tracked him after one of his most serious stunts in 2005, Garda Sergeant Brian McLean. He will approach the reception desk, or even the bar staff, and say, hi, I'm a guest, can I use your payphone? Can I use your cigarette machine? Can I use your internet? But by saying, hi, I'm a guest, he has given the immediate impression to the, rece the receptionist or that staff member, oh yes, this is a guest. And when he meets them again, they're more than convinced. But that was simply stage one of the con man's strategy. So while making himself familiar to staff, he's also trying to find out as much as he can about guests, like their names and their room numbers, especially if they appear wealthy. You know, if you hang around the bar, you will hear customers coming to the counter or even interacting with the waiter at their seats where room numbers and names of guests are exchanged. One thing he does, which is quite ingenious, is that he stands in line in breakfast queues and listens while guests give their names and room numbers to the maitre d'. With the foundations painstakingly laid, Betancourt would set about launching the third and riskiest phase of his con. Hello. This is where the groundwork pays off because once he's armed with this information, he goes to reception uh, when a member of staff is there that's familiar to him, that recognises him, maybe that member of staff has changed money for him and he goes and asks for a key card to a room, assuming the name of a guest. Knowing the, the identity of the room guest, knowing that the guest was actually out of the room, he would simply say, I've lost my room card or I've misplaced it. Is there any chance you can give me another one? Juan Betancourt combined his cleverly honed strategy with his hypnotic charm. And the result was the helpful receptionist would hand the con man a key card to a room or suite that in reality he should never have been allowed access to. He's extremely convincing with the uh, hotel staff 
and he's acquired the information very quickly while he's loitering in the hotel to be able to approach the staff in a very confident manner. Such is the culture of the five-star hotel industry that the guest is always right and uh, a guest looking like Juan Betancourt did is never going to be questioned. Top hotels are kind of like a specialised ecosystem for con men because if you know what you're doing, if you can crack the hotel code, then you can get away with all sorts of stuff. What makes swanky hotels particularly vulnerable to con men is it's all about making the high-rolling guest feel like he doesn't need to prove anything to you. He doesn't need to prove his identity. You know who he is. Uh, he's an old, trusted, valued customer. So it's all about like, yes, sir, no problem, sir, whatever you say, sir, right away, sir. It's all about being very deferential. And in that sense, it's ideal territory for the con man because it's all about confidence. And that is the con, the con man stock in trade. With the third phase of the con completed, Betancourt would casually continue, beginning the fourth stage of his high class scam. Now armed with his key card, he makes his way to the hotel room. He makes sure there's nobody else inside. He uses the key card. Once this man gains entry to the room, he can take his time and go around the whole room and take various different items such as watches, jewellery, identity cards, cash. And once he has done all of that, will he then call the security to the room to open the safe? That's his final move. The fifth and final stage of Betancourt's con would see the world's most illustrious hotels open up their guest safes for the hotel hustler and ultimately hand him their contents. He doesn't ring hotel reception, he rings hotel security and tells them that he can't get into his safe, that he's lost his pin number. Simply by virtue of the fact that he's in the room, that's then convincing enough for the security man to say, well, he's in the room, he must be for real so I'll open up the safe. So it's quite a clever con, but again, what he's doing is, is he's taking advantage of the social economy of the top hotel. The room itself appears undamaged and there's no break-in reported. The, the, there's no sign of any foul play inside the room. And so they open the safe for him, they leave, and he helps himself to whatever's in there, be it jewels, passports, credit cards, cash. He takes it and uh, walks right out by them. Betancourt had devised a near-perfect five-star hotel con, manipulating the impeccable service on offer to his own advantage. A con so perfect that throughout Juan Betancourt's criminal career, he was never caught in the act. It's a meticulous plan, it's flawless, it's plausible all the way through. It's very common that guests will lose their key cards, forget their combinations. He looks the part, he's wearing designer clothes, a flashy watch. He's charm personified, he's been described as hypnotically charming. So why would anyone question anything other than he was a guest? The safe What? In just over a decade, the hotel hustler had made an estimated million pounds out of the world's most illustrious hotels. But the international con man's career has spanned much more than a decade. In 1993, aged 17, Betancourt shocked and staggered the world with a death-defying con that catapulted him to global infamy. Over a decade, the stylish, suave and enigmatic con man Juan Carlos Guzman Betancourt made five-star hotels his hunting ground and developed the ultimate strategy in order to effortlessly infiltrate their finest suites and raid the bountiful safes and each time he did so with the unwitting help of the five-star staff. Rich people and those who pander to every need make quite easy marks because if you look the part and you talk the talk and you walk the walk, then they will often accept you unhesitatingly as one of their own and they'll accord you all sorts of privileges that wouldn't be accorded to normal people and you can get away with all sorts of stuff. Police estimate that Betancourt has gotten away with over £1 million from the hotels he has expertly robbed. But the five-star high life was a world away from the con man's humble beginnings. If we're to believe the legend of Betancourt, one of the stories is that he was born in the Colombian town of Royal Danilo in 1976, that he lived in a mud hut, that his mother was a cleaner and that his father was a farm labourer. Whether that's true or not, it's incredibly atmospheric. This boy from such a background went on to dupe five-star hotels extremely effectively. 
his mother admitted that he was treated badly and that his father had left when he was just a month old and she remarried and that he felt pushed out, that he didn't fit in. You often find that people who've grown up feeling unloved or have been abandoned grow up with quite a steely determination to succeed and not only succeed but succeed on their own and on their own terms. Now clearly Betancourt did succeed in some, in some way. He certainly came a long way from the mud hut in Colombia but you have to think to yourself, well, if he put that much imagination, that much energy and drive into some sort of lawful and legitimate lifestyle, actually, where would he be now? The story goes that Betancourt left home in his mid-teens after a family argument. Legend dictates that after running away from home, the con man ate from dustbins and lived in an abandoned aeroplane with other street children at Carly Airport in Colombia and aeroplanes and airports would become even more significant in Juan Betancourt's mythology. In 1993, when the con man was 17 years old, he entered the public consciousness for the first time. And what an entrance it was. So the first defining moment for Betancourt was in the early hours of June the 1st, 1993, and he really made an impact. He was found uh, wandering around Miami airport in the US. He appeared disheveled and the story was that he was a stowaway on a plane from Colombia and he hadn't been in the cargo area of the plane. Uh, his claim was that he was stowed away on the wheel hull of the plane. No one knows if the shocking story of the teenage stowaway is true or the first con in Betancourt's international career. This plane cruised at 35,000 feet, which is 5,000 feet higher than Mount Everest. And at 40 degrees below freezing, aeromedical experts say that this story is really hard to believe. It sounds impossible that a teenager would survive this kind of journey, but staff at the airport have said some people saw him dropping from the wheel hull. Apparently he lay there for a few minutes unconscious before he started to come round and was shaking. The risks that he seemingly took to leave Colombia really do point to the fact that this was somebody who had to escape, who really was determined to go and make another life for himself by any means necessary. Betancourt, under the assumed name of Guillermo Rosales, told the hungry press his fantastical story of escaping poverty and cheating death. He claimed he was 13 years at the time, which we know was a lie. It was established that he was 17 years. He also claimed that he was an orphan and that he climbed onto the wheel hub just before the plane took off and that he was there for the duration of the flight. And he said that uh, the image of his dead parents uh, helped him through the ordeal from Colombia to Miami. The story of the 13-year-old stowaway was a media sensation. Guillermo Rosales, really 17-year-old Juan Betancourt, was entrusted into the guardianship of a Miami police officer and his wife. But while staying with them, the teenager stole jewellery, tools and a bicycle. He also disappeared with the support fund of $75,000 American citizens sympathetically set up for the alleged orphan who had cheated death. However, before long, the Colombian officials set the story straight about the child who clung to the plane wheel from Colombia to Miami. The consulate revealed that this person was not a 13-year-old orphan, that it was Juan Betancourt, that he was 17 and that his parents were alive and that he had a criminal record in his native country. Betancourt was deported from Miami in 1994 and again in 1995 when he attempted to return. But his initial stay in the land of opportunity had been in education and laid the foundations for his future career as a con man. By the late 1990s, Juan Betancourt had perfected his hotel con. He was never caught in the act when he executed his five-star scam, and because he used over a dozen aliases, when the police did catch up with him, they never held on to him for long. In London, in 1998, after being arrested for his hotel con, the police released a man they believed was called Gonzalo Zapta Vives. He was being questioned over a string of thefts from exclusive hotels around London. Uh, he was charged and he never went on trial for this because he jumped bail. After jumping bail, he disappeared and nothing was heard of him for a year. A year later, in 1999, similarly, a man called Cesar Ortigosa Veras 
was also released from British custody. He was arrested at Heathrow Airport because he had used a credit card which had been reported stolen from Japan and he had assumed the alias Caesar Ortigoza Veras and uh, he, the, his alias was believed and he was fined £400 and uh, again he walked free from court and vanished. It makes much more sense if the crimes he's committed in different jurisdictions are under different aliases because then it makes it much harder for the police to put the bigger picture together and it makes it much more likely that you'll get off scot-free. But the aliases only worked so seamlessly because at that time the police technology was basic and so the con man was able to sidestep his true identity being exposed. He was very fortunate because in the late 1990s the Metropolitan Police didn't have an automated fingerprint search system so when he was arrested for perhaps what was seen at the time as an isolated minor crime, his fingerprints weren't taken and compared against outstanding crimes across the country as they would be now. If that system had been in place, the police would have known that they were dealing with the international con man Juan Carlos Guzman Betancourt. And two years after his Heathrow arrest, Betancourt returned to the British capital. In May 2001, he was back in London again and he really went to town, infiltrating exclusive hotels in Mayfair, Knightsbridge and Park Lane. And from one of the hotels, it's reported that he took around £40,000 worth of jewels and cash and from another £15,000. Betancourt must get a real thrill from walking into a hotel empty-handed but then leaving with sometimes tens of thousands of pounds. Maybe that makes him feel like he is somebody because after all, he must be better, he must be cleverer than the elite that he's stealing from. In his eyes, he's not just a common thief. The con man's carefully honed routine resulted in him leaving London with over 50,000 pounds, and he left the capital in style. From one of the hotels, he stole an Amex card and hired a chauffeur driven Bentley for 400 pounds to take him to the airport. Uh, where he bought a ticket to Paris and he also blew £8,000 on jewellery and designer clothes. Betancourt took to the skies with his ill-gotten gains and once again disappeared without consequence, destined for Paris, and his pattern continued. By 2003, Betancourt was in Las Vegas. He had conned his way back into the USA undetected, ready to raid the hotels that lined the Strip. In August 2003, in Vegas, he continues his hotel con and pulls off his most audacious con yet. From two hotels on the main strip in Las Vegas, two exclusive hotels, he stole £200,000 worth of cash and jewellery. The confidence and self-belief needed to pull off what is essentially a heist is really quite amazing because he has to be able to walk into that hotel and say, not only verbally if necessary, but with his entire body language, that I belong here. So I imagine he was very immersed in that role, but it must have been very exciting to him as well, because actually it's quite complex. It's almost like a scene from Ocean's Eleven. Detectives in Las Vegas reported that he would steal Rolex watches from hotel rooms and hand out these £50,000 watches to waitresses for good service. But playing the role of the modern-day Robin Hood wasn't the only role Betancourt adopted. The mythology of Betancourt is that he tells people uh, he's the son of a, of a, a diplomat and also that he's a prince from Colombia. So we can see this in, in high-rolling con men like Betancourt. That on the one hand, they desperately aspire to be part of this aspirational lifestyle, but at the same time they kind of despise it in that they think that these rich people are deserving marks, they deserve to get ripped off. So you've got this strange dichotomy, this dissonance between what you aspire to at the same time what you despise. After his trip to Las Vegas, Juan Betancourt returned to London in November 2004. Because of Betancourt's many aliases, he had always eluded the law when he had committed his five-star scam in Britain's capital. But little did he know when he set to work on this occasion that the con man's infamous reputation was so prolific that the Metropolitan Police now knew exactly who he was. In 2004, he's back in London and in his favourite hunting grounds of Kensington and Park Lane, and he's reported to have stolen £36,000 from one businessman in one of those hotels. 
Police officers suspected that this was the work of Betancourt, but they didn't think that he was in the UK at the time. They thought he was in Las Vegas or Russia. However, something happened on the 20th of December that proved the police's theory completely wrong. An officer recognised Betancourt while walking down the street and after following him, arrested him. The leather jacket that uh, Betancourt was wearing when he was arrested was worth £2,000 and was stolen from one of the suites on a hotel in Park Lane in London, as was the £8,000 watch he was wearing. Betancourt had no aliases to hide behind, and while in custody, the con man's past finally caught up with him. Where he was staying, police found a number of false IDs and they found a Russian passport and a Spanish passport with his photo on it and the name David Iglesias Vieto on it, uh, which had been stolen from the Canary Islands. The police found thousands of pounds in different currencies, plus the clothes and jewellery that he stole from the Dorchester Hotel. Betancourt held his hands up to everything in 2001 and 2004. Uh, he agreed to have 14 counts taken into consideration, but pleaded guilty to the £40,000 robbery in 2001 and the £36,000 robbery in 2004. Now, by anybody's standards, that's prolific. And by anybody's standards, that's a lot of money. But I imagine to him, given his very humble beginnings, that he must have really felt he was living the high life. This gave him everything that he needed. In April 2005, aged 29 years old, Juan Carlos Guzman Betancourt was sentenced to three and a half years in prison. The reality was that he would spend considerably less time behind bars. Betancourt was sentenced to go to Stanford Hill Prison on the Isle of Sheppey, which is a low security prison. He was just two months into his three and a half year sentence uh, when he told prison guards that he had a dental appointment. In open prisons, it's standard practice for inmates to be able to do such things. So an appointment was made and off he went. In April 2005, Juan Betancourt left the prison for his dental appointment. And shockingly, he actually did attend that appointment. Uh, but afterwards, he didn't go back to prison. He just kept walking. He crossed the bridge to the mainland and vanished. Less than three months into his three and a half year sentence, Betancourt walked out of Stanford Hill and never returned. He just kept walking across the bridge onto the mainland. The headline read, flamboyant jewel thief cons his way out of prison. Little did the con man know that that newspaper headline would be the key to his eventual downfall, but not before executing one of his most audacious cons to date, this time in Dublin. By 2005, Juan Carlos Guzman Betancourt was one of the world's most infamous con men, traveling the world and robbing the most illustrious hotels as he went. Justice had caught up with the Colombian for his five-star hotel scam in London, but less than three months into a three-and-a-half-year sentence, Betancourt conned his way out of prison. He disappeared. No one knew where he was going to turn up next, but most likely it was somewhere where there was an exclusive five-star hotel. He's pushing 30, and what else can he do? Nothing. He doesn't stay in one place for any length of time. He's a loner. So, really, it's quite a tragic story if it weren't so morally wrong. Just 10 days after strolling away from his prison sentence, Betancourt arrived in Ireland's capital, Dublin. When in Dublin, he was using one of his dozen or so aliases, and this time he was claiming to be Alejandro Cuenco, who was a 25-year-old from Spain. With a new identity, new age and new nationality, the 29-year-old Colombian set about his five-star hotel hustle. Only on this occasion, fresh from prison, the fugitive had to deviate from his usual con and place himself in an utterly vulnerable position. At 9.30am on the 16th of June 2005, uh, Betancourt walked into a five-star hotel in Dublin city centre wearing blue jeans and a t-shirt which had the slogan save water, drink beer, written out. Usually he's wearing designer clothes, but this time he was just out of prison 10 days. He was desperate probably for cash at that stage. So he improvised with what he had, his confidence and charm. When he entered the hotel, he proceeded immediately towards the corridor areas and the lift area, giving the impression that he was a guest in the hotel, making his way directly to his room. Betancourt would traditionally begin his con by taking his time and ensuring he became a familiar face to the hotel staff, so they were conned into believing he was a guest in order to dupe them. 
but in Dublin he did not do that. He skipped the safety net stages of his heist and went straight in for the kill, risking his con unravelling. By 10.15am on that morning, we know that Betancourt had made his way to the top floor, where he met a cleaner coming out of the top suite, which usually cost approximately a thousand euros a night to stay in. An American couple, their children and the children's grandmother were staying in the hotel suite and they were in town visiting from Beverly Hills in LA. Betancourt had set his sights on the most expensive suite in the hotel, but he was taking a huge gamble. He was relying entirely upon his hypnotic charm to succeed. His first interaction with the cleaner was to say that he was a brother of the, of the room guest and that he was staying in the hotel suite and he'd forgotten his room key, which he'd left inside in the suite. And he asked her to let him in to the suite, which she refused to do so. You, I'm afraid that you can't know. I, I don't have um, permission to, to let guests into rooms without... Mm -hmm. She asked him to go down to the reception, where they would give him a new key. By going off script, the con man had failed to shortcut his way into the suite. However, he had evaded detection. Even though the cleaner didn't give Beckencourt the key, there was nothing to arouse suspicion. He was very polite and they engaged in a general chit-chat conversation, just passing the time. During that short space of time, though, he did pick up a vital piece of information. Uh, he found out that the American family had booked a babysitter for the hotel suite that night, and so he was able to go to reception confident and armed with this information. The con man had potentially acquired the key to succeeding in the next step of his crime. But Betancourt was playing his riskiest game yet. Betancourt made his way to the foyer where he engaged with the receptionist. He spoke with the receptionist in bad English to begin with and then asked him, do you speak French? To which the receptionist did and both engaged in a French conversation where Betancourt explained, I have mislaid my room key, can you replace it? and uh, convinced this person to cut a new key card from him. And just as he was turning away with oodles of confidence, he turns back and says, by the way, are we okay for babysitting tonight? Yes, sir. Okay. Thank you very much. Now, the receptionist had actually made the booking for the babysitter that morning through housekeeping. So he was aware that such a booking was made. So you can imagine that by asking this question, the person at reception had absolutely no doubt but that he was who he said he was. Now with a sweet key card in his possession, Betancourt could revert to his classic con. He has the key card and the room number and he makes his way towards the room. Uh, he makes sure there's nobody inside and he gets into the hotel suite. And he then proceeded a general sweep of the room to see if anything of valuable was lying around inside the room before he made a call to the hotel operator. Basically tells them that his children have interfered with the safe combination and changed it and so he can't get into the safe and would somebody come up and give him access to the safe. In turn, the, the operator made contact with the security officer of the hotel to attend to the, the guest suite for this purpose. After improvising access to the room, Betancourt could return to his tried and tested script. The security guard had a safe decoder device with him uh, which he placed onto the uh, safe and within a minute or two he managed to open the safe. During this time, Betancourt engaged in a small talk conversation and gave the, the, the uh, appearance that he was, uh, by all intents and purposes, the guest in that room. Betancourt was completely convincing. The con had worked once again. When the security guard opened the first safe, he noticed a large amount of cash and also passports. Betancourt then asked, would you please open the safe in the second bedroom? The security guard proceeded to the second bedroom and opened the safe. Again, Betancourt had given the same excuse. My children are doing this to the safes in every place we go. The security guard had no suspicion of Betancourt, simply opened the safes and then left. And Betancourt could set to work. So he helped himself to everything in the safe, which was an American passport, an American express card, a ruby ring, and £2,000 worth of cash. He then sealed both safes by entering his own PIN numbers and then proceeded to leave the room within a matter of minutes. 75 minutes after strolling into the hotel, Betancourt had stolen £2,000 worth of US dollars, not to mention the credit card, jewellery and passport. Against the odds, Betancourt had done it. A master con man.
from leaving the hotel that morning, Betancourt went to Grafton Street, which would be the high-end shopping district in the Dublin city area. Using the American Express card he'd stolen, he purchased a number of expensive items in various shops throughout the area. His first port of call was a record store nearby Grafton Street where he spent £500 on CDs and DVDs and he was just getting warmed up for what was to come. He then set about buying a large amount of expensive clothing before eventually going to one of the most exclusive jewellers in the Dublin city area and purchasing a Rolex watch on the card for €16,000. Within an hour of leaving the hotel, Betancourt had spent almost £20,000 including £11,000 on a watch. And Juan Betancourt had done so long before the hotel residents even realised anything was amiss in their suite. The American visitors that uh, Betancourt had robbed only realised that their safe had been emptied the following day when they were packing to leave and they couldn't get into the safe and they rang hotel security and they were really surprised to hear from the security man who told them what had happened the day before. The guests were equally shocked, of course, when the safes were opened and there was nothing inside. The family had been robbed, and until that moment, they had had no idea. These crimes can often be written off as romantic, you know, faceless crimes by this debonair, clever con man who waltzes in and cons people and charms them with his, um, with his clever chats. But these are real people involved here. They must have felt violated, someone in, you know, coming in and stealing their personal property. It's not faceless, it's real and it's hurtful. Because Betancourt doesn't actually have to face his victims, it's not a direct con, he doesn't actually have to think about the consequences to those victims. And imagine that he can pass himself off to himself as actually just a bit of a rogue, you know, and actually look at me, aren't I devilish, aren't I daring, look at what I do, without having to think about the emotional side of what he's doing and the devastation that he's causing. After the disturbing discovery, the police were called. The priority in the early stages of the investigation for Detective Garda Brian McLean was gathering as much information as possible. When I viewed the CCTV footage within the hotel, I was able to see the man who uh, was pointed out by the security guard as the man whom had opened the safe. A picture was unfolding of how events played out on 16th of June 2005. The problem was no one had any idea who the cunning hotel thief was or indeed where he was. But the credit card he had stolen revealed his movements after he left the Five Star Hotel. I ascertained the information by speaking with American Express about the number of transactions that took place on the card after it had been stolen. Now I decided what I would do is I would call to each of the shops for two reasons. One was to ascertain the CCTV footage of Beckencourt making the transactions and the second would have been to obtain the uh, original receipts which would have been handled by Betancourt as he signed for various transactions. We, and those uh, receipts may gleam fingerprint evidence. While the papers were checked for prints, Brian McLean returned to the Five Star Hotel to formally interview the employees. And he had a stroke of luck. On that morning, I was waiting to speak with the security manager. Standing in the foyer, I picked up a UK Times newspaper. I read an article in one of the pages regarding a flamboyant jewel thief who had escaped from a UK prison. This jewel thief, as I read, was a person who targeted hotel rooms. When the security guard came to me in the foyer, I immediately showed him the newspaper yeah. and said, is that him? And he replied, yes. The Dublin Garda now knew they were looking for Juan Betancourt. And then reading the article, I could see that the Metropolitan Police Force in London had previous dealings with him and they were referred to in the article. So that was my first point of contact. I really suspected that Betancourt would have left the jurisdiction at that time. But having spoken to the London Metropolitan Police Force, they said, no way, he would definitely still be in Dublin and he will definitely hit you again. Brian McLean put out a warning to the other high-end hotels in the city, warning them they may be targeted. Each hotel took the warning on board, but the staff member would always smile and say, that would never happen to us. And that was the attitude that Betancourt had relied upon for the decade he had practiced his five-star hustle. But the detective believed the con man would not be residing in the luxurious surroundings that he stole from while he was staying in Ireland. He imagined the con man's accommodation would involve less salubrious surroundings. I had a hunch that Betancourt would stay in a particular area of the Dublin city centre where hostels are located. The reason for this was because I believed that he would 
keep the head down and stay in a place that doesn't ask too many questions. After all, Betancourt was a man who was unlawfully large and I focused my attention on that particular district of Dublin. Brian McLean set about using traditional detective work to see if his hunch was right. Using the photograph of Betancourt available to me from the newspaper article, I decided to draw up a flyer. I spent a whole day calling to every single B&B, hostel and hotel in the Dublin city centre area, distributing these particular flyers. I spoke with the hotel staff in each ho of those premises, asking, is the man staying with you? And if he is, to make contact. Brian McLean's instincts paid off. We received a phone call from a hostel close by, saying that Betancourt, the man on the flyer, was actually currently in the, ho in the hostel. Due to the distance away I was, uh, I made contact with the local guard station, asking for two uniformed guards to go to the hostel and apprehend the man. Exactly a week after Betancourt had hit one of Dublin's leading hotels, the detective's hard work had paid off and he had him in custody. Betancourt was wearing the same Rolex uh, watch which he had purchased the previous week on the stolen American Express card. He had a passport in his possession, an American passport, which was the property of the tourist who had been the victim of the crime at the hotel. And he had already doctored it really professionally and placed his photo in it, implying that his next port of call was the US. Uh, years earlier, he described the US as the land of opportunity, so obviously that was his plan. The Garda knew exactly who he was. However, Betancourt was charm personified when attempting to convince Brian McLean that he was his alias, Alejandro Cuenco. Betancourt explained that his name was Alejandro Cuenca. He gave me his date of birth and he explained to me that he was a Spanish national. Trying to convince me, he pulled up his sleeve to show me a tattoo of the Spanish national flag on his upper arm. Had I not known the information which was available to me, I would have actually believed him. But the detective was sure the man he had in custody was a con man. He simply had to absolutely confirm it. After I had arrested Betancourt, the standard procedure is that he is fingerprinted and photographed. That was a standard procedure for every prisoner, but in particular in relation to Betancourt, I decided that it was necessary to, to send his fingerprints via Interpol to the London Metropolitan Police for confirmation that the prisoner I had arrested was in fact Betancourt. And they were able to do that and, and uh, return to me saying that is correct. The prints confirmed what the detective already knew and face to face, Brian McLean could immediately see why Betancourt was such an effective con man. He was very calmly spoken, um, very polite, almost shy is the way I would describe him. Uh, he answered every question truthfully, in my opinion, and he made full admissions to his role in the crime. But while Betancourt believed he was duping the Garda into releasing him on bail, he had no idea that he was not the only one with a strategy. During the questioning at Betancourt, I decided on the strategy of not revealing to him that we were aware of his true identity. He was thoroughly uh, cooperative in relation to all aspects of the uh, crime. The common man often has uh, an overinflated sense of himself, and sometimes they will want to show off what they've done and how clever they are. Um, so in that sense, giving him enough rope to hang himself was quite a good idea. Um, but then there is also a sense in which um, Betancourt has quite a, a standard MO when he's arrested, which is because he's quite confident that because of his aliases that he's used, that he won't have his former crimes pinned on him. Maybe he figures that if he cops to the crimes that he committed in this jurisdiction and plays along, plays ball with the police and cooperates, then he'll be allowed out on bail and he can skip the country. Had we not known of Betancourt's true identity, it is likely he probably would have been given police bail and subsequently absconded from the country. But uh, he didn't know we were aware of his true identity. Using the persona of Alejandro Cuenco, Betancourt admitted everything. Only this time, the con man was the one being duped. I was biding my time and waiting for the right moment to say, I know who you are now. You are Juan Carlos Guzman Betancourt. And it wouldn't be long before the con man's world would come crashing down and the staggering number of countries in which he was wanted would be revealed. In 2005, Juan Carlos Guzman Betancourt's career as a con man and hotel thief had finally caught up with him. By posing as a guest, 
the Colombian had gained access to a suite in one of Dublin's finest five-star hotels and emptied the safe of passports, jewellery, thousands of pounds and credit cards, spending over £20,000 on them in just an hour. During the interview at Betancourt, in respect of the hotel burglary, he was fully cooperative in respect of, um, of, of telling us how he spoke to the cleaners, the receptionist, the security staff and how he emptied the safes of the property within. He was also fully cooperative and truthful in relation to his interactions with various people in the shops that he went to with the American Express card. Now in custody, the con man believed the Garda thought he was a 25-year-old Spaniard called Alejandro Cuenco and confessed in great detail about what he had done on the 16th of June 2005. I received confirmation through Interpol that the fingerprints we had taken from the prisoner uh, confirmed he was Juan Carlos Guzman Betancourt. And uh, the information also uh, suggested that he was wanted and he had absconded and he was wanted in a number of jurisdictions. But Betancourt was completely unaware that Detective Brian McLean and the Dublin Garda knew he was an infamous and internationally wanted con man and hotel thief. Now they had all the facts and a full and frank confession, they could drop their bombshell that they knew he was Juan Betancourt. I went to him on my final interview, which I commenced by explaining to him that I now know who you are. I now know you are Juan Carlos Guzman Betancourt. I now know you are from Colombia. The prisoner said, I have nothing more to say to you. And he made no further reply during that interview or at any time after that. Under the alias of Alejandro Cuenco, Betancourt had admitted everything. He believed this tactic would mean that he would be released on bail so he could then skip the country. He was wrong. This time there was no escape for the con man. Later that day, Betancourt was charged with offences relating to the crimes for which he was arrested and he was brought to the Dublin District Court where I gave evidence of his arrest and his charge. Betancourt was remanded into custody. He didn't actually apply for bail after he was charged and he sat on remand until the hearing date which was the following year when he pleaded guilty and was sentenced to two years in jail. Because he had sat on remand he had served a good bit of that two year sentence so he was due for release in December 2006. Whilst in Irish custody Interpol released a statement to all countries in which Betancourt was wanted inviting them to pursue an extradition request. Although Betancourt had walked away from British prison in 2005, he was not extradited back to the UK. It was France who were the first nation to seek an extradition order. Back in late 2001, Parisian police had arrested and briefly detained the con man after he duped hotel staff out of room keys. However, in his usual style, upon release from Dublin in December 2006, the con man disappeared in mysterious circumstances once he was extradited. Betancourt resurfaced in September 2009 after he vanished for almost three years. He was arrested in Vermont after he claimed he had accidentally crossed the Canadian-American border into the USA after his car had broken down. It seems he was attempting to sneak back into the country he first duped in 1993. And once again, the con man was in US custody. By crossing into what he had described as the land of opportunity, um, he's now going to have to face uh, trial and uh, sentence for the offences that he's already committed there and been convicted of. On the 9th of June 2010, Betancourt pleaded guilty to the charge of entering into the USA illegally. He faces up to 10 years in prison. He is also wanted in four states for his con man crimes, including the £160,000 hotel robbery in Las Vegas in 2003, and it is likely they will prosecute. The international con man is also wanted in Canada, Colombia, Japan, Mexico, Russia, Thailand and Venezuela. It seems the only room Betancourt will have access to for the foreseeable future is a prison cell. But even now he is behind bars, the suave, handsome and charming criminal remains a complete mystery. He's possibly one of the world's most accomplished con men. Um, it's only when police actually confront him and say, we know who you are, that he's unsettled or phased. But otherwise he seems quite proud of his crimes, of what he's carried out to date. 
It does make you wonder whether is this just the nature of the con man or actually has something happened in a very difficult and deprived childhood that makes Betancourt want to just carry on running, carry on using aliases and jumping from country to country. It makes you think, well, can he ever settle down? And that's very sad. Can he ever stop pretending? Can he ever stop running? Now 33 years old, Juan Carlos Guzman Betancourt is as much an enigma as when he first mysteriously arrived in Miami in 1993. And that mystery fuels the world's fascination with the hotel hustler. I knew there was something special about this guy. I knew he was wanted around the world. I knew that various police forces uh, in Europe and the United States had an interest in him. But I never would have uh, foreseen the, the media interest that, that took place when, when he was eventually arrested and brought to court. He doesn't know any other kind of lifestyle, what else can he do? He's got no home, he's just this transient criminal. So really, if it wasn't so morally wrong, it'd be quite a sad story. <laughs>